All righty. For everyone, uh, thank you for coming tonight. It is a, a Zoom discussion. We hold these once a month uh, with parents, with individuals that are very much interested in education, whether they work in the field of education or not. Uh, tonight's discussion um, is legislation that has uh, been somewhat of a topic most recently on the implementation that occurred from pieces of legislation this last legislative um, session that Sine died almost a year ago. So I'm Elsie Arntz and the state superintendent and Katie, I'll turn it over to you. Well, hi everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, so we have the agenda up on the screen. Um, thank you, Superintendent, Superintendent Artson for introducing us. So like she said, this is one in a long line of community um, meetings that we often hold every month. Um, so we're gonna be going over four pieces of legislation today and then we'll go over some questions. We'll also be throwing a number of resources into the chat box and I will throw my email in there as well. So if you want any of these things sent directly to you, please let me know. Um, but now I wanna quickly introduce um, the kind of the stars of the show today. So we have Rob, our deputy superintendent and Christy, our assistant superintendent and they will take it over from here and go into some more depth on uh, these uh, pieces of legislation. And if you have any questions, just raise your hand or throw them in the chat and we'll get to them as they pop up. So thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Superintendent Arnson. Uh, Rob Stutz here, Deputy Superintendent, also the Chief Legal Counsel here at OPI. Appreciate everybody making it out tonight to talk about the implementation of several of the pieces of legislation. Um, if you attended one of these meetings before, you uh, know that we have the agenda and a number of resources on OPI's website. If you haven't attended one of these meetings before, that's okay. We'll walk you through how to access the same uh, resources that we'll be discussing so that we can all just follow along. Um, what I'd like to do is start off by sharing my screen. And I hope everybody can see that okay. Um, this is the OPI front page for the website. And we have a couple of different ways you can access this information. Um, I'm going to have Christy go ahead and throw a link to the website into the chat. Um, but right here off the homepage, you can go to, uh, for example, parent resources. And from there, there's going to pull up a list of a number of these community discussions that we've had. If you scroll down under parent resources, upcoming events. Um, today we are at the March 20th, 2024 um, legislative briefing. You can get the link there, but you can also pull up the agenda. That's the same agenda that um, was displayed by Katie. I've got the agenda right here. And so with no further ado, let's hop right into the legislation that we'll be discussing tonight. The first one that we're going to be discussing is House Bill 352, Early Literacy Intervention. If you don't know how to access the legislation, you can go to ledge.mt.gov. And from there, you just click on look up bills. You can drop down to say, I want to listen, look at house bill. And um, I've already I've already pulled them up, but we are at house bill 352. You just enter 352 here, hit find, and you'll get to the same page, which is the page that I had already pulled up. So when you're at this uh, page, and we'll be doing this for each of the bills, you can see that there's some information about the legislative history of the bill. And we're gonna be looking at um, the bill as it's been uh, finalized for the laws of Montana. This is a little bit different in the language that you see in the Montana Code annotated, simply because there are parts of the bill that don't make it into the statutes that are organized by topic when you're looking at the code. I'll explain a little bit about that as we walk through the bill. Uh, but the first bill that I'll, I wanna look at is uh, House Bill 352. We're gonna look at this version that's here in the PDF. And when you pull it up, it says there right at the top, early literacy targeted interventions. So this is a, an early literacy bill. It provides 
uh, really wonderful program, uh, actually a series of three programs that uh, help kids with early literacy interventions. I should mention that the Board of Public Education has the initial uh, responsibility under this bill to identify some evaluation criteria and methodologies, and they've completed all of their work. And so the next question is, um, when do these programs begin? There are three programs. One is the home-based program, one is the classroom-based program, and one is the Jumpstart program. And uh, it's the home, excuse me, it's the Jumpstart program that's had a little bit of uh, public conversation about when those bills, um, mm -hmm. when those programs begin. This is important because the extra funding for the school districts to put on those programs is linked to um, them being able to count a certain number of hours for the Jumpstart program. And I apologize if I'm scrolling too fast, but I just want to cut to the chase. If you're looking at the PDF version of the bill, on page four, it has the bottom of section three of the bill. You know it's section three because section four is right here. This is where the Jumpstart program is created in section three of the bill. And it has to, the program has to have at least 120 instructional hours. So it's very involved um, to make sure those, uh, those students get the, the type of early literacy intervention that they need. One question that has come up though is when can this program begin? So I wanna just take you down to two parts of the legislation real quick. At the very end of the bill, so now I'm looking at PDF page 15 of the bill, you can see an effective date is July 1st, 2023. And then you can see a separate effective date for sections five through seven of July 1st, 2024. We were looking at section three of the bill regarding the Jumpstart program. So that effective date was July 1st, 2023. Pretty straightforward, except the legislature provided immediately above it a transition section. And that transi transition section says that the Board of Public Education, Office of Public Instruction, and the school districts shall collaborate and prepare for full implementation of sections one through four in the school year beginning July 1st, 2024. So that raises the question, does the legislation begin July 1st, 2023, or does it begin July 1st, 2024? And the way OPI interprets this is that although the bill is effective beginning last July, the program can't be fully implemented before July 1st, 2024. So what parts can be implemented before July 1st, 2024? The legislature has provided down here in the next sentence that the evaluation methodology be available for administration in the spring of 2024. So all those steps that are necessary to um, uh, determine which evaluation methodologies are available to the school districts and for the school districts to run those evaluations so they can determine which kids are eligible for the early literacy intervention programs can begin in spring of 2024. And all that remains is for the program to begin. And as you can see, the full implementation and can't begin until the school year beginning July 1st, 2024. This has caused some confusion in the field, OPI has got uh, guidance that's available, and we've also fielded a number of questions. Um, and just to make clear that uh, it's important to understand what the legislation says so that we can make sure that we implement it the way that it's written. And so that is one of the questions that has come up. Can the um, full implementation begin prior to July 1st, 2024? And OPI has followed the rules uh, for how to read statutes and said um, that can begin July 1st of this year. And with that, um, that's just an overview of one of the implementation questions that have come up. I do want to emphasize, though, that uh, OPI staff have been working with the field in this an excellent program with really enthusiastic response. And even though the program under the statute isn't fully implemented before, July 1st, 2024, there's the possibility 
for school districts to begin running early literacy intervention programs in June of 2024. So we really want to um, encourage that enthusiasm, um, even though we have the language of the transi transition section of the bill that says that the program can be fully implemented starting in July. If there are opportunities to reach out uh, to those kids and um, provide some of the ongoing early literacy interventions, certainly we encourage that. Are there any questions? Well, Rob, uh, this is Elsie. I don't see any hands up at this point. The other part is this is fully recorded and all the uh, information that we have, and we do have a handout at the end, I'll be more than happy to get. There we go. K Katie's gone ahead and put this in. Perfect. Let's move to the next one then. All right. Well, the next bill on the uh, agenda is House Bill 350, excuse me, that's the one we just did, is House Bill um, 549. This is our public charter school bills. And again, this is a great program that um, OPI just today was working with uh, school districts to make sure it gets uh, fully implemented. I'm going to pull up the language of the bill. And one of the questions that um, has come up is when do the um, public charter schools open? And what's the process for opening uh, a school? And as you can imagine, there are um, there's a lot built into this bill. The Board of Public Education plays a critical role in receiving applications and approving applications for those public charter schools. And they've, they've done that. And for the approved public charter schools, um, there is a requirement for a public charter contract between the school district and the um, Board of Public Education. And that has happened as well. Um, and then the next step is uh, in order for the school district to get opened in the state's school uh, database system and start receiving the funding and getting the accreditation and the assessment, there's a process that the legislature has already established for opening a school. And to just introduce you to that real quick, that process, um, now we're hopping to the part of the laws that are already codified. These are the the include the language in the bills as well as language that wasn't addressed by the legislature this session. The Montana Code is organized by subject. Title 20 is the primary one that has to do with education. Within Title 20, there's Chapter 6, which addresses school districts. Within Chapter 6, there's an existing uh, Part 5 on how to open or close a school. And within uh, Part 5, there are different statutes for how to open different types of schools. So for example, 20-6-503 uh, has the legislative process for um, how to open a high school. And you can see here, um, I know this looks like a lot of uh, um, not particularly interesting uh, symbols or words and letters, but this just explains in part that this process for how to open a high school hasn't changed for many, many decades. So that process exists in Montana law, even though it wasn't part of the bill. So when we go back to the bill, and again, we're looking at um, House Bill 549. Uh, I mentioned earlier that there is a, uh, a contracting process, and you can see right here, section six of the bill, this is on page nine of the PDF, has some of the requirements for that charter contract. I don't want to spend too long talking about, uh, you know, contract requirements in statute, but I think it's important to note that paragraph six of that section requires that um, this opening pro this um, review process must ensure that each school meets all building health, safety, insurance, and other legal requirements for school opening. Now, this bill does not provide a different process for how to open the school. And so when we're interpreting statutes, we have to try to give effect to all the legislation, both the legislation in this bill and the legislation, the legal context in which the bill occurs. And so that other legal requirements for school opening are uh, in, include 
those processes, for example, on how to open a high school. So when we are working with public schools out in the field, we've got guidance, we've got a form, we've got a support team here that has uh, reached out and continued to reach out to schools to make sure they, that that school opening process is smooth, um, effective. One thing, if you are with a school district, I want to point out is that there is a requirement that uh, those that information be submitted by June 1st. I also note that the requirements differs depending on the type of school. Um, so you'll want to uh, look at those statutes, uh, perhaps reach out to OPI staff. Certainly, we've got links to all that information on our uh, public charter page of the OPI website. Let me just click over to that real quick just to show you where to find it. Again, if you go to the OPI main page, right up here at the top, we've got charter schools. You can click on that and it'll pull up a page that has links to the guidance document and a form for uh, school districts to use to apply to open a, a school. The other thing I should mention is that the school opening process for public charter schools is not any different than the school opening process for uh, any other type of school that a district is opening. So once the Board of Public Education has approved the application and entered into the charter contract, there's a really straightforward way for school districts to get that school open. Are there any questions? Well, Rob, I have one. Uh, just to salt the water here a little bit, what is the purpose for following that statute of opening that you have just annotated? What does the charter school get for doing that. It's been authorized by the Board of Public Ed with their authority. Mm -hmm. And then using that uh, next section of Title 20 to open the school, what does the school get then for, or the district receive when they fill out the um, opening of this school for charter? Sure. Well, um, that's a good question. The I, I should mention that the process for opening it is not particularly onerous, most of the information that's required by the statute is already in the charter applications that the school districts have put together for the Board of Public Education. There <laughs> is a little bit more. Um, for example, one of the things that's important here in Section 3 of that statute is the county superintendent shall estimate the average number of belonging. That's what Montana law ca calls the number of kids enrolled in a school. And um, that average number belonging is important because in the bill, and I, I'm gonna just run down to the funding section of the bill. So you'll have to excuse me while I do a big scroll. So now I'm down in section 12 of the bill, the funding for public charter schools. And I'm actually gonna be down here on page 18 of the bill, paragraph two. In order for the uh, school district to receive what's called a basic entitlement, that's a type of funding that they can receive for the school, they have to have an average number belonging greater than a particular number. So for an elementary school, 70, a middle school, 20, high school, 40, and so one of the things that the school districts get by following that school opening process is they have gone through the legal process to ensure that the estimate of the average number of belonging is going to allow them, the school district to receive that funding. Um, the other thing that they get is they're uh, in compliance with a statute that uh, addresses how to open or close a school, one of the requirements in the bill. Um, I'll, to be clear, not specifically, it's referred to indirectly. Um, another thing that they get is the Office of Public Instruction has a computer system that keeps track of all the schools in Montana. And so by going through the school opening process, the schools for each district are in the system and they would have that access to um, all of those support services that OPI offers accreditation to make sure that the school is meeting the Board of Public Education standards, the uh, assessment process, the special education, transportation, all those, the school nutrition programs, all those things that schools do that are um, part of OPI's system. So um, it's hard to quantify in a 
quick answer, superintendent, all the benefits they get by following the school opening process. But we certainly don't want school districts to uh, delay that process and potentially miss out on those benefits. Any other questions? Do you see any hands raised, Katie? Nope, no questions. And I've been throwing um, all the resources that Rob's talking about are in the chat, um, so you can easily access them. Excellent. Christy, quick question for you. How many um, charter schools did the Board of Public Ed go ahead and approve? Yes, Superintendent. They have approved 19. Um, and then there are some districts in Montana that have two or three um, of these charter schools within their district. And yes, so we are looking forward to uh, welcoming all of those into the public school uh, here at the OPI. Perfect. Hey, Rob, let's go on to the next one then. All right. The next bill that we'll be discussing is House Bill 338. This is a bill regarding Indian education for all. It's a great bill that provides um, uh, not only some expanded um, reporting requirements for school districts, but also um, um, implements more specifically the Indian education for all portion of the Constitution and provides for some financial accountability um, um, for the school districts that receive, all school districts receive Indian Education for All funding, and it provides some accountability um, to make sure that they are providing the uh, services and spending the money as required by Montana law. So uh, one point, uh, two points of conversation that have come up regarding this bill can be found near the end of the bill, And I'm looking down here at, um, I'm on page four, and we're looking at, uh, at section four, paragraph four of the bill. And one of the things to note is that when you're reading legislation, parts that are stricken through have been removed and parts that are underlined, underlined have been added. And you can see that there's been a strike through here and an underline here. And this one's a little bit anomalous because um, the bill initially removed this form language and then they reinserted it. So that language really hasn't changed. But in any event, the interesting part about this section 4B is that the public schools districts um, shall file an annual report with OPI that specifies how the Indian Education for All funds, or as we sometimes shorthand, EFA funds, were expended. So this entire first part of the reporting requirement is not new. In fact, it's been around since 2007. Now, there was some there were some additional parts added. For example, down here, there's um, some additional information about the detail. And uh, more importantly, there's a new requirement that the report the, to the OPI must include information about instruction. And so a shorthand way to talk about these is there's uh, one part that has a financial reporting, and that's the part that has existed since 2007. And then there's a new part about the instructional reporting. The reason that's important is because it's um, useful for everybody to know how schools are spending their money on Indian education for all and what type of instruction uh, they're doing, including how that was developed with our tribes around the state. The other reason that's important though, is because there's a requirement down here or an applicability section down here that has become a subject of some conversation in the public. We know that the law, the bill is effective beginning July 1st of last year, but it says the new reporting requirements under section 4.4, that's where we were, apply to funds distributed beginning on or after July 1st, 2023. What does that mean? Well, when there are Indian education for all funds that are expended, the reporting for those funds doesn't occur until the next school year. So in this school year, the 23-24 school year, School districts are reporting on the funds that they spent on the 20, during the 22-23 school year. And the requirement 
for the new reporting requirements only applying to July 1st, 2023, means that if, uh, if that reporting is new, then it wouldn't apply to last year's um, expenditures. As you can see though, the requirements for the financial reporting is not new, it's existing language. And only the requirements for the instructional reporting was added by the legislature. So that reporting requirement applies to the funds expended last year. That doesn't apply to the funds beginning July 1st, 2023. And this has been a source of some conversation because um, school districts, um, some school districts have reported that they're having a difficulty reporting the funds that were at the level of specificity that um, or were required last year. Um, I should mention that the Office of Public Instruction has generated a report about the number of districts that have underreported their Indian Education for All funding. And initially, 80% of the school districts had underreported Indian Education for All funding when those first drafts of the financial reporting were um, filed in September. Those reports don't need to be finalized until uh, December. And so OPI staff worked with districts to try to make sure there was uh, the support, the guidance, the help for those districts to get accurate, um, complete reporting in. And by the December 10th deadline, we had cut that number in half of the number of districts under reporting. So that was a, a really good lift on the part of OPI staff to reduce that underreporting. Nonetheless, there were still 40% of school districts who had underreported their Indian Education for All spending. And so certainly there's room for improvement there. The other part of the bill that is um, sometimes subject to the uh, public conversations is down here. The legislature provided that if a school district files a report that doesn't show, that fails to show all the reports received under this uh, section, were not spent for the purposes of Indian Education for All, the base budget and funding for the subsequent fiscal year must be reduced by the amount of funding that was not spent for the purposes. And this is an interesting sort of way to word it because the legislation didn't address who reduces the spending and or who reduces the funding. And it makes a distinction between what they report to OPI in that financial report we were discussing and what was actually spent. So what should a school district do if its report had a mistake? If they didn't report that they spent the money, but they actually did, is there a process, superintendent, you would call it, is there a due process for school districts to actually go and demonstrate that they, um, that they spent the money even though they failed to report that expenditure? OPI believes that the answer to both of these questions, that is, how do they prove what they spent and who makes the determination about the reduction, are already addressed in current law. To find that law, we're, gonna, we're going to, again, jump to the Montana Code Annotated because this wasn't part of the bill. We'll go to Title 20, that's education. We'll go to the finance part of Chapter 9. In Chapter 9, you can see that there is the funding for a basic system of quality public schools. And down here, you can see in 344, there is this statute that talks about the Board of Public Education's duties uh, regarding base aid. And right here under paragraph two, it says, the Board of Public Education may order the superintendent of public instruction to withhold base aid, and base aid includes Indian education for all, when the district fails to submit reports or budgets as required by law or rules adopted by the Board of Public Education. When we go back to the bill, we can see that they're required to file an annual report that specifies how the funds were expended. And so if they file a report that doesn't specify how the funds were expended, right, there was a underreporting, then the Board of Public Education can order 
the superintendent of public instruction to withhold those funds? That answers the who question, but then the question is, what's the process that they follow? Fortunately, that process is outlined in statute in the next paragraph, paragraph three. It says before basically BPE orders the withholding of any funds, the school district is entitled to a contested case hearing. That's kind of like an administrative uh, uh, trial before um, in front of the Board of Public Education. So uh, we have in an existing statute, the answer to both questions raised by that legislation. One is uh, who has the authority to uh, withhold the funding order the withholding of funding? And what is the process in case the school district made a mistake for them to get that? Now, I should point out that um, this interpretation of the statutes, there are some people who have argued that they should be interpreted differently, but this is how OPI has um, reviewed and the superintendent and uh, in consultation with uh, me and other uh, legal staff, um, this is the uh, interpretation that OPI has been applying. And fortunately, we've got some really great, um, uh, again, support staff here who are working with those districts to provide guidance about Indian Education for All reporting and to provide guidance um, about uh, how to address the concerns regarding both the existing uh, financial reporting and the new uh, instructional reporting the school districts will be doing for the first time this year. Thank you, Rob. I don't see any hands up. Katie, do you see anything? No hands, um, but oh. I did throw our Indian Education for All resources in there. And if you need any of the things that Rob mentioned, we can email those to you. Excellent. I do see Senator uh, Beard's hand up. Thank you, Superintendent. And thank you, Rob. This is good information. And I wish we would have been able to delve into some more technicalities like this at the Interim Education Committee meeting last week. Uh, but it kind of devolved into other avenues. A lot of us have questions on these particular technicalities, and one of them on this Indian Ed for All. Um, I understand that the reporting requirements need to be um, snuffed up a bit, could we say? But um, And this bill uh, addresses that. But I wanted to know if there have been any changes uh, in the level of teaching the program and the program requirements and hours and so forth. If you could just address that quickly, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, Senator Baird. I can speak to that uh, quickly. Uh, so as we saw down here, the instruction reporting requirement is new to the statute, to the statute, but it is not new to the accreditation reporting that school districts have done. And under OPI's old school system, school districts reported every year for accreditation purposes, um, the type, a, a narrative paragraph or so um, description of the type of Indian education for all um, uh, programs that in instruction that they provided. Now that's required by statute. So that's exciting to mm -hmm. see that requirement written into law. Um, but there is another component to it that is new this year. OPI's accreditation system now requires school districts to not only districts to not only describe the type of Indian education for all programming that they do, but also requires them to provide evidence of it. And so the accreditation system has been updated to require school districts to upload um, documents that demonstrate that Indian education for all um, programs and instruction have been provided. So um, although the provision of Indian Education for All is a local decision um, and the decision about how to spend and report Indian Education for All funds is a local decision. There is going to be greater accountability because the instruction um, uh, reporting requirement through the accreditation system is going to really document a lot more thoroughly how that is delivered. Rob, thank you. I think that just addresses exactly what I was looking for. Thank you. You're welcome, Senator Beard. I, I should also mention that the Office of Public Instruction works. We have a wonderful Indian Education for All um, uh, program here at OPI that provides support to school districts if they're looking for materials for classes, if they're looking for speakers, if they're looking for activities and ideas for providing Indian Education for All. Um, we do have our IFA program at OPI and encourage school districts to reach out and, 
and really use that resource. Thank you. All right. Good job. Let's go on to the next one then, being mindful of everyone's time. I thank you, Superintendent, trying to do that. <laughs> uh, but we're covering a lot of we're covering a lot of uh, legislative ground in a fairly short amount of time. The last one that I want to discuss is um, House Bill 949. This has to do with uh, data modernization, mm -hmm. one that was discussed at um, the uh, at the recent committee hearings. And I don't want to dwell on this one too long. It's a 12 page bill, but the long, the long and the short of it all is that there was a, a education and workforce data governing board that was established by this legislation. OPI is one of the primary um, agencies involved and sitting on that board. And I wanted to assure the public that um, OPI is participating in those meetings. There are some fairly tricky legal questions that that board is going to have to address. Among them is what, um, what information is OPI required to gather under the law? Because OPI um, does not gather more information than it's required to for reporting and accountability purposes. There was a review, an audit uh, some years ago that looked at OPI's uh, gathering of, of education information and the result of that audit was that OPI should not gather more information than it needs. There are a lot of reasons for it. It's be more onerous on school districts to um, report information that OPI is not going to use. There are the concerns about the administrative and um, security aspects of OPI holding on to data that it's not required to gather. So there are lots of important considerations. Um, but uh, the gathering of data is one of the things that um, that education and workforce data governing board is discussing. And the other thing that um, we're looking at is the ability of the Office of Public Instruction to share data out of that database. And that's a really um, it's a really perilous question because when we're talking about personally identifiable information, about children being shared from the education system to other computer systems, it really raises a lot of concerns. Those concerns are addressed in part, um, significant part, by a federal law called FERPA that addresses privacy and educational records. And we also have to consider the privacy rights under Montana law. So there are just a lot of really touchy subjects around the um, gathering and sharing of student information. But OPI is participating as part of that group, um, trying to find some solutions to these questions and uh, looking forward to that conversation with some of the other agencies. We don't wanna find ourselves in a position where we're violating privacy and violating privacy laws. And so um, we're, we're being very um, judicious about how we approach those sensitive questions. Rob, so taking a look, Katie, do we have anybody with a hand up or any other questions that there might be? Um, there's nothing in the chat and it doesn't look like anyone's raising their hand right now. Okay, excellent. Well, all of these documents uh, are in the chat and they are also on our website that Rob annotated to. And um, we are more than happy to uh, answer any questions. Our, my purpose is to be as transparent as possible and to make sure that our students all across our state get educated in the best manner that they can. So we're a partner in education and hopefully tonight's uh, recorded discussion um, helped heal that conversation. So with that, blessings to all. Thank you for all that you do. And uh, thank you for putting our Montana students first. <laughs>